NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone tonight? Good. Well, thanks again, as always, for coming out to join us this evening. One of the greatest uncertainties in projections of future climate change is how terrestrial ecosystems contribute to or help counteract the rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide. This is because these systems can both absorb carbon and emit it. Here at JPL, we are using satellite remote sensing and sophisticated modeling to understand how Earth's carbon, water, and nutrient cycles are linked and how they impact the Earth system as a whole. Tonight, our guest will give an overview of the latest data sets and model developments from JPL and discuss new insights into the behavior and understanding of terrestrial ecosystems in a changing climate. Our guest tonight is a research scientist here at JPL and the science lead of a new instrument about to launch to the International Space Station called EcoStress. He is originally from LA, got his undergraduate and graduate degrees from UC Berkeley, and then did a postdoc at Oxford University, where he taught for a few years before, before joining JPL in 2010. His research focuses on terrestrial ecosystems, water, carbon, and nutrients, using a combination of supercomputer models, remote sensing, and field campaigns from the Amazon to the Arctic. When he's not sciencing, he's juggling his six-year-old and three-year-old kids, playing basketball, snowboarding, breakdancing, and doing acrobatic yoga. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's guest, Dr. Josh Fisher. Hello, I'm uh, Josh, and I will not be doing acrobatic yoga today. Um, that will be another Von Karman series, I suppose, they'll have to start up. Um, so uh, I'm a scientist here at JPL, and my focus is um, on plants, on vegetation, and everything that impacts uh, plants on land. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a whirlwind journey through the types of questions and puzzles that we try to solve um, as ecosystem scientists. Our story begins in 1835 when Hans Christian Andersen wrote a children's story about a young woman whose royal identity is established by her test of her physical sensitivity. The test, unbeknownst to her, was that a pea was placed in her bed covered by 20 mattresses and 20 feather beds. In the morning, she lamented about the discomfort from the pea. Only a real princess would have such sensitivity, thus verifying her claims to royalty. The, the Earth's land surface, the plants on Earth, represent a very small portion of the total Earth, yet exert an enormous influence on the Earth's climate and the fate of the, of the Earth. It's the figurative pea in Earth's bed. And what we're trying to establish is the true future. What is the future? The royal identity. How is this done? It's done in models. It, we start with models, models that start with essentially land or soil, and you kind of throw a bunch of weather at it, some CO2, and <laughs> up pops an ecosystem. And if you, if you change the, uh, the weather around or any of these conditions, then the ecosystem changes. Very, very simple way of representing how ecosystems behave. But these ecosystems and these plants are made up of um, a huge amount of processes that we're trying to understand at the biological to the global scale. Starting with microns large pores we can't see with our eyes on leaves that when open allow plants to take up CO2 and release water. But when closed, plants stop taking up CO2. And so these microns, large pores, exert influence on the entire Earth. So they take up CO2. They also release water. It's hard to kind of picture water coming out of the leaves. So I, I put this little geyser coming out of the leaves so you can imagine water coming out of the leaves. Um, and within the leaf uh, is the photosynthetic, photosynthetic machinery. 
um, very, very complex chemical process that we have to somehow extend to the global scale. And we have to make a lot of assumptions because we can't uh, model every single electron or chemical process in these leaves. Not every leaf is created equally. Um, even within a given tree, there's leaves that are shaded, there's leaves that are bigger, there's leaves that are older. Um, and so how do you represent the diversity of leaves within a single tree, let alone across all the trees and plants of the planet? We need to uh, understand how radiation or light diffuses through canopies, turning on and off these leaf processes, and how that light heats up uh, the, the, the planet. Um, and this is something that we can see from space as well. Plants intercept rainfall. This is water that does not go to the soil, and the soil processes are not turned on with this water. But a lot of water is, um, uh, does come through the, the canopy into the soil. And so we have to understand and uh, be, able, uh, be able to predict what that difference is. Plants were actually first included in climate models, not because of the biology, but because of the physical structure. They got in the way of the winds of the atmospheric models. And so they also have this um, not only carbon cycle, but just physical structure influence on their system. We need to understand how leaves uh, drop in deciduous systems. Our models shouldn't drop all the leaves at once or keep all the leaves on at the same time. So we need to be able to predict that delicate balance of, of leaf um, phenology. We know that plants take up carbon and make, make sugars and make wood, but they also burn that sugar from metabolism, just like we burn sugar from metabolism. And we, want, we need to understand how much sugar they store, how much sugar they burn, uh, and when they run out of sugar, are they going to die? There's a huge diversity of plants, thousands of species. We cannot model every single species or even see every single plant or species. So we have to make these assumptions about uh, groupings of, of trees. Sometimes we call them plant functional types or um, other types of groupings, such as grass or broadleaf trees or needle leaf trees. Um, and so the amount of plant types that we define um, influences how we predict the outcomes to changing climate or CO2. The more plant functional types we have in there, the more computational demand there is. And so there's this trade-off between realism and our ability to conduct these experiments. Some plants grow faster than others. Uh, some plants uh, put their carbon into wood. Um, some plants put their carbon into roots more than others, into leaves. And so we need to be able to understand that balance. How much nutrients do plants take up? Um, and how do they do it? Again, questions we ask. The layers in the soil um, are really important for, for understanding the, the eco, terrestrial ecosystems in the Earth's climate. Soil stores a lot of carbon and nutrients. And, we, and the more soil layers we include in these models, again, the more computational power required, but um, the more realism as well. We need to understand how leaves decompose, how fast they decompose. We don't want our models just dropping leaves and instantly decomposing or sitting there and piling up. So again, getting that balance right. And what about all the worms and termites and microbes that eat these dead leaves and wood and then respire back that CO2? We have to be able to understand how that's changing um, uh, as temperatures and, and, and water, water cycling changes. At the end of the day, we're interested not necessarily in single trees, but the entire ecosystems. How all these different trees and grass and systems integrate across the larger picture. Hydrologically, um, snow melt is a very difficult process to uh, model. Um, uh, a process that involves a lot of radiative and heat transfer, but very important for ecosystems because when there's snow, a lot of things are turned off. And when they're wet, a lot of things are turned on. So we have to get that balance right as well. How the water moves through this top surface into the deeper groundwaters is also very important, and how it evaporates back up to the atmosphere. And of course, the, the, the larger evapotranspiration, the evaporation off the soil and the transpiration out of leaves. This is not a picture of evapotranspiration. You can't see it. This is just clouds, but you can imagine 
you know, the water coming off, off these trees. We need to understand how water runs off into our rivers and oceans and how it's routed over the landscape. And all these different water components, the snow, the groundwater, the soil moisture, they need to keep a delicate balance with each other. Otherwise, our models might build up too much snow or too much groundwater. And so we have to keep a delicate balance of water. Hard to visualize, so I just put a guy balancing over water, but um, water balance. Then there's dynamic, dynamic components of ecosystems, how trees compete with one another, right? Um, so uh, they compete for space, for light, for water, for nutrients. Which plant wins when there's that kind of a fight? And when there's a disturbance, which plants go and colonize and establish first? Or when there's a, a change in climate, are there new bioclimatic envelopes for plants to move into as other plants um, die out from? And speaking of death, how do you kill a tree? This is actually a harder question to answer than one may realize. There's a lot of different ways trees can die. And again, these models have to kill the trees at the right rates for the right reasons. Is it because they overheated? Is it because they ran out of carbon for metabolism? Is it because of a wind throw? Is it because of a disturbance, like fire, the largest uh, disturbance in Earth's system? How do you model fire? And what comes off of fire? S smoke and other gases and aerosols. So all these processes get wrapped up into the simple diagram of a modeled ecosystem. Of course, we know that ecosystems are a lot more complex than this, right? They look a lot more like this, with all these processes embedded within. And so that's what ecosystem scientists try to understand. And that's all well and good, but we've thrown another kind of monkey wrench into this machinery, and that's this. Without even putting axes or labels on this, a lot of people can recognize this. It's becoming iconic. It's the rise in CO2 in the atmosphere, influencing plants and influencing our understanding of how plants respond. So all these complexities and uncertainties are wrapped together in these climate models run by different institutions, some out of the US, Japan, France. And so there's a lot of disagreement about how to model um, carbon metabolism or how to model evaporation. And so that's why we get a lot of these differences um, with what we project to the future. How a plant behaves to my French colleague is different than how a plant behaves to my Australian colleague. And so we have to come together as scientists to really understand the world beyond our backyards. And so this, this is a, a kind of a classic picture of these models shooting out into the future and diverging heavily. The models that go up are saying ecosystems are going to do just fine. And the models that are going down are saying ecosystems are going to crash. Now, this paper um, was put out um, in 2006, a number of years ago. So a lot of development has happened in these models since then. The authors put out another paper just a couple of years ago, about 10 years later. And this is what the models look like, um, more like today, which is not too different. We're still faced with a lot of uncertainty. I think the only thing that's gone better is that we've picked a more like modern color scheme with the lines. But um, you know, I, I don't think that is useful science. So w what we have here is essentially like that fable, the blind men and the elephant, which I kind of think of as just terrestrial ecosystem modelers. And everyone is saying something different about the, the world in front of them. But they're all kind of saying the same thing. And they're all wrong, but they're all right. And so how do we put this knowledge together to really understand the elephant in front of us, the fate of Earth's ecosystems in the biosphere? Now, a lot of these models, as you can imagine, are built in the US, in Europe. Um, and so I've put together this cartogram, which blows up the size of the country, depending on how much investment there is in the models. And so you can see, if we're trying to come up with a global picture, but we're developing models based on our own inherent biases from how we understand how plants work from our backyards, we're going to have these inherent biases about the world at large. So the way I, I approach this problem and this, this, this challenge is through a triangulation of carbon, water, and nutrients 
as they impact climate and as they're impacted by climate. And you can address this from an ocean and an atmosphere and a land perspective, and I address it from a land and ecosystem perspective, but working hand-in-hand with my atmospheric and ocean and ice colleagues at JPL and worldwide. So one of the first things that I did is I started taking all these models from all over the world and putting them here in-house on JPL supercomputers to run with common conditions. I didn't want the, the French guys running it one way and the, the, the British guys you know, running it a different way. We, we had to run them the same way so we can understand that the differences are not due to the fact that somebody started their model in 1801 and the other one started in 1850. Um, so we've been using uh, NASA's supercomputing infrastructure to help solve that part of the problem. But that's really not good enough. Uh, we still need to understand how well the models are doing. And so here's a plot of all the land on Earth by latitude. So you can see um, there's more land in the higher latitudes. And this blue line is the breathing of the biosphere, how much breathing in and out ecosystems do globally. And most of it occurs in the tropics. But there's actually what we call two poles of the carbon cycle. The amount of carbon stored in ecosystems is, maximizes both in the tropics, where you have all these big trees, and in the Arctic, where you have millennia of carbon locked in the soils and the permafrost. Now, how well are these two poles sampled? As you can imagine, on the ground, we sample in our backyards. We sample in the US, we sample in Europe, the, the places that have the money uh, to do this. And so we are undersampling the most important regions on the planet. That's where NASA and JPL's satellite remote sensing can really come into play because we now have a global picture uh, across multiple dimensions of ecosystem properties. And I'll go through some of that now. Coming into a case study in Amazonia, it's our, it's our crown jewel of ecosystems. This is where the, the enormous amounts of, bio, the, the largest biodiversity on the planet exists. This exerts uh, a huge influence on the Earth's climate as a whole. It breathes in the CO2 that we breathe out and it breathes out the oxygen that we breathe in. It is the lungs of our planet. And so we are very concerned with what is gonna become of our lungs. Are we gonna be, do, are we gonna breathing fine, be breathing fine, or are we, are we gonna be choking? Looking at these models, we see that some of the models are predicting that the Amazon forest is gonna die back into the future. And this is quite worrisome. How are they doing this? It's because of a predicted uh, increase in droughts. Drought uh, intensity, drought magnitude, and drought frequency. The largest drought in the history of our records in the Amazon occurred in 2005. And so scientists thought, well, great. I mean, this is not great, but this is great because it's kind of a, a test to see what, how, how, how resilient is the Amazon. Um, so when this drought hit in 05, we said, okay, what did the Amazon do? Did it choke or did it, was it, did it do all right? And one of the first studies that came out after this drought was very curious, a bit, a bit, a bit of a head scratcher. And it showed and suggested that the Amazon greened up during the drought. This didn't really make much sense to a lot of people. But a lot of high profile papers came out saying that the Amazon forest greened up. And their argument was that, yes, there was less rainfall, but there was still plenty of water in the soil. And there was actually more sunlight now. So the plants could photosynthesize more. But they didn't actually have um, on the ground measurements to uh, substantiate this hypothesis. But it was, it was very intriguing indeed. So what we did is we took some of the satellite measurements. Uh, there was a, a mission called the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, which gave us the precipitation. And I had actually done a lot of my PhD work on evapotranspiration. So this was able to give us the amount of water that actually evaporated out of the soil. You need both. You, you, you can't just know that there was less rainfall without knowing how much evaporation there was to determine how much water there is in the soil. And so if we look at a record of, of, of rain in the Amazon, it kind of goes up and down and up and down. And in 05, during the drought, there was a little dip, but it was hard to tell if the soils dried out. So when we put this evaporation drought on it, we can see how much the Amazon dried. And so that really gave us a better indicator of, of how dry the Amazon was. But that's only half the coin. We also needed to know if the trees were dead or not. 
Now, we, we couldn't get this from space. There was no spaceborne asset. So we had to go into the Amazon. And we spent a lot of time and energy censusing these uh, long-term monitoring plots to see uh, if, if the trees died or not. Very challenging to do. The bottom line was that at the end of the day, when uh, areas that were more dry, according to our rain and uh, evaporation uh, index, we also saw a very tight correlation with tree death. Drought equals tree death, essentially. Not too surprising, but remember, those first papers said that the Amazon rainforest greened up during this drought. So we had a bit of a conflict in the scientific literature. When our paper came out, some of the original authors of the Green Up paper uh, broke ranks, and they kind of reanalyzed their data and, and found that they had not quite properly uh, accounted for fire. There was more fire than this drought, and the smoke was kind of getting in the way of their signals. And so they came up with a new paper that said Amazon forest did not green up. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like gang warfare, but nerd style. You know, they, it, you, know, you don't want to see these guys in the, in the science conference hallways. It's, it gets tense. Um, but, you know, like pocket protectors get thrown down. I'm kidding. Um, but, again, so there's, there's been scores of paper on this, this, I, this, this topic because it's important. This is really important for us to understand what's going to happen to the tropics, the Amazon, and ecosystems under this projection of increasing uh, frequency and magnitude droughts. I mentioned that the 05 drought was the biggest in the history of our records. And these models are project projecting more frequent, bigger droughts. In 2010, an even bigger drought hit, just five years later in the history of our records. A bigger drought hit the Amazon. Five years after that, an even bigger drought hit the Amazon. So these projections and the models are actually starting to play out uh, uh, in front of our eyes. Now, what's different uh, in the recent droughts, unlike the 05 droughts, is that we have new um, capabilities. We have new technical capabilities from space and from models. <clears throat> we can now observe the glow of plants called fluorescence. Um, this is actually a bit of a mistake. Uh, we, we didn't intend to do these measurements. These are measurements from three different satellites. OCO2 uh, is out of JPL. Um, there's one called GOSAT out of Japan and one out of um, a satellite called GOM. Out of, out of Europe. And these satellites were not intending to measure fluorescence. They were intending to measure something else. But they happened to have this measurement of fluorescence that we started scratching our heads and thinking, what is this measurement? This is quite weird. And we dug into it, and we found that it was this glow of plants. And so now, for the first time in the history of humankind, we can see photosynthetic activity as the glow of plants, when before we were just seeing if they were green or not. We saw that the Amazon greened up or it was not green. This is like going to your doctor and your doctor saying, I can't help you until you're dead. Right? I can't tell until you're not green anymore. Now we can see activity is, is slowing down or changing before plants, crops, drop their leaves um, or, or, or die. NASA also established the Carbon Monitoring System, where we started integrating our observations across ocean, land, and atmosphere, and uh, anthropogenic carbon uh, cycling. And this CMS uh, program is, has been established and is now moving into new applications and, and venues. Another really exciting avenue that is just on our horizon is we're starting to look at the International Space Station. We don't see a lot out of the space station in terms of Earth observation for science inquiry or for, um, especially for ecosystems. We see, you know, um, astronauts doing their thing on the space station. <clears throat> if we look at this year's calendar, starting in March, there's a series of launches going to the space station on SpaceX rockets, cargo resupplies for the astronauts. And they each tell us something different about ecosystems. I'm going to tell you a little bit about EcoStress, which is the first one coming up, out of JPL uh, in June. It's, it's right on the horizon. Um, and I happen to be the science lead of it. Uh, so, of course, I'll tell you about it. So 
it starts with this premise that the landscape is very heterogeneous. There, lots of plants are doing lots of things at very small scales. And so we need to know what's going on everywhere but at small scales. It's kind of a, um, a conundrum, if you will. So we can measure stuff on the ground with sensors. Um, we can you know, run drones around the landscape or even aircraft. And then, of course, we have our, our space satellites. So I, I've built sensors that I, you can stick into trees, and it'll tell you how much water they're taking up. We put them at these towers that measure the water fluxes and carbon fluxes in and out of ecosystems. We have drones that can fly back and forth across crops, seeing how much water is needed or how much is used, as well as through forests, uh, determining um, uh, 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 tree inventories. But we really need something that does everything in one. We can't put drones and towers and aircraft everywhere. And so if we look at our current satellite capabilities, this is MODIS, and it shows this landscape um, at one kilometer resolution. It's kind of picking up that heterogeneity, but not quite not. Um, this is Landsat at 60 meters resolution, a much sharper picture. And you can see it's starting to pick up that, those differences across the landscape. This is our managed landscape with agriculture. If we look at um, a natural landscape and we paint on the vegetation here, we can see that it, the, the riparian corridors occur at very fine spatial scales. MODIS is not going to pick that up. Landsat will. So that's space. What about time? This is the evaporation uh, measured uh, at one of the sites on the ground every 30 minutes. Um, and you can see the kind of bumps and wiggles over the course of the year. Landsat comes over only about every 16 days. And if there's clouds in the way, then you know, every 32 days or multiples thereof. So even though it's got the spatial resolution, it doesn't quite have that temporal resolution. Ecostress is going to come in and uh, measure um, or fly over us every about three to five days, really picking up that seasonal cycle. Another interesting aspect about, about plants is that uh, there's a diurnal cycle. Um, some plants, when there's water stress, will close those stomata in the afternoon when it's really hot so they don't lose a lot of water. And then they'll open back up you know, in the early evening before, the, before um, you know, they lose sunlight to do a little bit more photosynthesis. Most of our satellites pass over us at the same time every day, the, the polar orbiters, 10.30 every, you know, every time. So they miss this diurnal cycle. They miss this uh, daily functioning of plants. There are some satellites that hover over us geostationary all the time, but because of the orbit, the, the pixels are very coarse. And so they would lump together plants that are shutting down and plants that aren't shutting down in, into one, and so you wouldn't be able to distinguish this. So at, at the end of the day, we want to take a look at this landscape and, and apply some color to it. We want to figure out if there's, if there's droughts, which, which trees, which species are going to die first. Because some will more than others. Some need more water than others. Some are less efficient with water than others. So that's a little bit about eco-stress. And um, I, we're lo really looking forward to the launch uh, in June. And hopefully I'll come back and give another talk uh, later on some of those results when, when, when we get them. I'll just briefly mention a couple of other uh, missions going to the space station. Uh, I'm not necessarily involved in, but um, they're my colleagues and partners, and there's synergies among them. Uh, Hisui is coming out of Japan, and this will measure, um, uh, it's called hyperspectral or, or spectroscopic signatures, like the unique fingerprints of plants. So even though EcoStress will be able to tell you which plants need more or less water, this one will tell you kind of what those plants are. And so, uh, that's extremely useful because we'll know what the plants are and how much water they're using. Uh, JEDI um, is using LIDAR, these lasers from the space station, to map out how big trees are, and that'll tell you um, uh, how much carbon is stored in the ecosystems. And then finally, OCO3, another one let out of JPL, uh, will be measuring that fluorescence again, as well as CO2 in the atmosphere, all on the space station all with that diurnal cycle um, sampling. So very exciting uh, to have these all up. And so essentially, we go up on, on a SpaceX rocket, um, cargo resupply. I tell people that we're going up with the pizzas, uh, the pizzas for the astronauts. 
And so then the Dragon uh, capsule docks. And what's really interesting about the International Space Station is that we've gone up on an American rocket. That's the Canadian robotic arm removing the instrument. And we're mounting to the Japanese module. So we are very much internationally coming together both engineering and scientifically to tackle global scale uh, questions. And EcoStress is going up first, so we get the best real estate on here. It's kind of like the, the cul-de-sac of the space station, whereas OCO3 kind of you know, gets the side street a little bit. <clears throat> so what's interesting about these instruments is that they measure the structure, JEDI, for example, the composition, which was his sui, the evapotranspiration, the water use, uh, which was EcoStress, and the fluorescence, which was OCO3. These are essentially lenses of ecosystems. These are what comprises ecosystems. Ecosystems are comprised of structure, composition, and function. And, and there's the CO2 aspect. We can also get all of these using airborne spacecraft, uh, or not spacecraft, air, airborne platforms, which is also very useful for being able to target certain areas that we can't see very well, like the tropics, for example, where it's very cloudy. So even if we have this, uh, the satellite sensors, we may not, might not be able to see through the clouds as well. And we need very high spatial resolution in the tropics because all the plants are very different from one another. And so we need, we need to really drill down. Another important aspect about the tropics is that not only are they very sensitive to climate, which I've shown, but they're also very sensitive to CO2. If you remember those plot, the, the plot of the, 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 the ecosystems crashing, that was due to the droughts. But some of them that were doing really well and that was because those models were very re responsive to CO2, CO2 being good for plants. Droughts, of course, related to CO2 being bad for plants. And so we need to understand how these plants, how these ecosystems are going to respond in the future also to rising CO2. And so what do we do? Uh, we conduct experiments um, where we pump CO2 onto ecosystems and, um, and see how they respond. And this, this, this is very difficult to do. Uh, as you can imagine, it requires a lot of import of CO2, expensive infrastructure, and it costs a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars, and you don't actually get a lot of trees. Um, and what, more importantly, what you also don't get is this long, you know, we're interested in the next century, over, over, you know, over the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. And, and we can't run these experiments for that long. So we don't know how the ecosystems might be shifting, adapting to this long-term uh, change in CO2. So these CO2 uh, enrichment experiments have been incredibly valuable. In fact, are kind of one of our only tools to assess this, but still limited, especially with the in the tropics, because we haven't been there. There's not a single one in the tropics, and this long-term aspect. So we've been really stuck there. So that's kind of no solution. We've been just stuck. Something new that I've been exploring in the past couple of years and spinning up is an entirely different field. You thought you were coming for an ecosystems talk? I'm going to talk about volcanology now. <laughs> we tend to think of volcanoes as that thing in the background spewing out lava or whatever it does. But the volcano complex actually extends well in to the surrounding forests. And so if you think about a landscape of trees, when a volcano forms, there's these cracks and fissures in the Earth's surface. And the number one dry gas that comes out of volcanoes is CO2. And it comes out at very high amounts. And then it diffuses into the ecosystems in, in, until it reaches background conditions. These are exactly the concentrations that we expect to see globally over the next 50, 100 years. And this has been occurring since geologic age, hundreds of years. So we actually kind of now have a natural, long-term CO2 experiment given to us by Mother Nature through the volcanoes. So I, I kind of stole this image from the gravitational wave, guys. So, um, so we now are taking two communities that normally actually don't ever interact, the ecology community and volcanology community, and we're putting them together 
And we think this can really radically change our knowledge of, 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 of ecosystems, and, and, and actually volcanology as well. I think I have a slide on that. So one of the first things we did was we went, we went to our backyard, Mammoth. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that it's, a, it's an active volcano. Um, I, I never realized that. I realized it was a good place to go snowboarding if I wanted to spend a lot of money. Um, so what we did is we ran our aircraft uh, over it to look at the biomass and the chemistry and the greenness and the evaporation. And we saw these really tight signals across the landscape to when, when there was increasing CO2, we saw direct changes in the ecosystem structure. And we got the CO2 because the USGS had mapped on the ground all the CO2 in the area. You know, it's, it's in their backyard as well. So that's great, and that was really exciting. But what we really need are the tropics, right? That's that breathing of the biosphere. And we don't have you know, the USGS uh, in the tropics necessarily. So um, what we've discovered is there's this chain of volcanoes in Costa Rica that has been emitting CO2 into the rainforest uh, for hundreds of years um, at different amounts, kind of giving us a nice experimental setup. So we went into these uh, volcanic jungles uh, a few years ago to examine and figure out on the ground what was happening. And so we really wanted to figure out, was there a window into the future of the Earth hidden in the jungles of Costa Rica's volcanoes? And here we are taking a lot of measurements. Um, and, and so this is a picture to show that we came out alive. Um, so what we found were, again, clear and direct signals that when there was greater CO2 exposure, the plants were changing. What's also particularly interesting, uh, at least to me, is that the CO2 coming out of volcanoes is very different than the CO2 in air. It has a different, uh, what we call, isotopic signature. It's a different kind of chemical signature, if you will. And so trees, when they breathe in the volcanic CO2, it becomes part of their chemistry. And so trees in these systems are actually made up of volcanic CO2 when they're more exposed. So they actually keep long-term records of volcanic CO2 in their wood. Now, I mentioned we didn't have the USGS in there. What we've been exploring is we've been uh, developing drones, uh, a partnership with um, a company called Black Swift, and they have these drones that can fly close to the, the treetops and sniff out the CO2 where it's leaking out of the landscape, They're, thereby mapping out the CO2 um, of the larger landscape. This is also really valuable, not just to me as an ecologist, but to the volcanologist. Volcanic CO2 is an early indicator of volcanic activity or eruption. But they cannot monitor CO2 on every volcano. And even in the tropics, they have CO2 monitors and they get easily damaged. But if the trees can act as those sensors, and not just a couple sensors, but thousands of sensors telling us what the volcanoes are doing, this, could, this is potentially a major breakthrough for the volcanology community. And I'm not just saying this as an outsider. This is words coming from my volcanology colleagues. All right. Um, so I've talked a lot about the tropics. And uh, that's where a lot of my interests lie. But I would be remiss not to talk about the Arctic, two poles of the carbon cycle. I'm not going to talk too much about it for the sake of time. But um, the same type of techniques um, you know, we've got a lot of carbon locked up, methane locked up that's being released. And the models, of course, are all over the place. This was a paper I put out on, on Alaska. And you can see different colors, which is basically, um, in each of these Alaskas are different models. The point of this is that almost every color combination is shown. It's like a giant game of Twister, where the models completely disagree as to what's going on in the Arctic. So NASA's launched this giant, almost 10-year campaign to really tackle the Arctic, and I'm a part of that. I helped, uh, uh, helped write the study, and, and I'm a PI on one of the projects for that. And these airborne capabilities that I talked about, we've just flown for the last two summers in Canada uh, and Alaska, really trying to tackle the ecosystem responses to warming um, and uh, other, other climate impacts, but in the Arctic. 
Now, back to this, uh, this change uh, diagram. Uh, I mentioned a lot about the, the, the CO2 fertilization. Plants love CO2. They can, they'll take up more CO2 if you give them more CO2. But they also need water and light and nutrients. And so nutrients is kind of one of those things we forget about with plants. We always think to water plants, and of course they need light, but nutrients. And that, that's the same with climate models. It was one of those, the last things we've developed in models. There's a lot to be developed. So we look at that CO2 rise again. What does this mean in terms of the equation for photosynthesis? CO2 being right there with water and energy creating oxygen and, and the CH2O is our, our sugars or our wood. So as CO2 goes up, does that mean our trees are continuing to get bigger and bigger, so big that they basically take over our houses? I mean, there's, there's got to be a limit to how big these trees get. And the climate models had originally not had nutrient limitations in them. So they were projecting too much CO2 being taken up. Plants were too happy in some of the models. And so we started looking at this, and when we put this nitrogen being the one of the, the, the most limiting nutrients for plants in the models, it led to fundamentally altered behavior. I surveyed my colleagues around the world as to what processes they're going to put in their models over the next five years. And I sized their response uh, by the frequency of the response. And the, the most common response across the world was nitrogen. I, I've been developing a lot of the nitrogen modeling myself. Um, there's a lot, of a lot of mathematics here. Um, the most important thing with this model that you should take from this is that I gave it a really cool name, which was FUN, um, which is Fixation and Uptake of Nitrogen. So I'm literally putting FUN into modeling. Um, now, again, we need these observational constraints to the models. One thing that we've discovered is that there's this underground economy uh, associated with plants, associated with fungi, mycorrhizal fungi. They're called micro, and there's two dominant types of fungi that associate with plants, and they're scattered throughout the landscape. Um, some tree species are associated with one, AM, arbuscular, and the others are associated with the other, ECM, ecto ectomycorrhizal. And these fungi go out and get nutrients for the plants, and in exchange, the plants pay them in sugar. It's a carbon economy for the nutrients. Now, as you can imagine, some fungi charge more than the others, and some plants pay more than the others. So we need to understand this below-ground economy to really understand the nutrient constraints and functioning of ecosystems. And how they, so what we've, uh, what we've learned is that these, ecosystems, these fungi actually kind of pulse the trees in different ways that are visible to some of the instruments that we can see from space. So if we were able to see each tree species individually, we'd know which fungi was associated with it. Well, we can't. We can't see each tree uh, like that. What we found is that instead of looking at each tree, we look at groups of trees that respond more similarly to each other than other groups of trees. The fungi act like hands to the trees like they're puppets. And of course, we've gone out and done a lot of field work. This is at the top of the Andes in Peru, looking out into the Amazon basin in the cloud forest. I spent four years in there conducting a fertilization experiment, putting nitrogen and phosphorus down um, and collecting soils and leaves to really test a lot of these models and hypotheses. And we're now able to really use a lot of the uh, remote sensing, airborne, and ground data to constrain the nutrient aspects. And we've put these into the climate models. And so now we have global models that are now constrained by nutrients and fungi. You wouldn't think it that we could see and even care about fungi when we're talking about ecosystems or, or, the, global, or the global carbon cycle. Finally, the last part of the triangle I'll talk a little, a little bit about is water. So we've been interested in climate and CO2 and ecosystem response. But at the end of the day, we're also concerned about us, people. And what we need is water, especially in California. Um, and we need certainty in our water, especially as the water cycle is changing. 
This is all related to climate, but we need to just know how much water we're going to have and can we grow our crops and when can we thrive as a civilization. So we, st we have this un uh, incredible uncertainty in our water cycle, the water cycle being made up of rain and snow and evapotranspiration, the surface soil moisture leading to the deep groundwater storage, that's that triangle S, delta S, and the runoff. So our uncertainty in our water availability is tied to the, each of these components in the water cycle. We are now at an age in NASA and the space community internationally where we can observe every single component of the water cycle from space or about to be from space. So I mentioned that TRIM, the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, that has since died. We have now launched a global precipitation measurement constellation in collaboration with space agencies around the world. We have some ability to get snow from space. Um, we're still working on that. But JPL has been running an airborne snow observatory, ASO, which uses LIDAR, those lasers, to, uh, to see how thick the snowpack is and, and also how dark the snowpack is to, because that determines the melt rate, darker snow melting faster than brighter snow. I've talked a lot about evapotranspiration. Um, I, I won't talk too much more about that, but EcoStress is going to uh, provide a major breakthrough in, in our ability to transcend scales across the globe. JPL um, also launched the SMAP, the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission. Have you guys heard of that at all? It's been out for a couple of years now. Um, and it, I, I used to tell kids at the open house that with the active part, which is, it doesn't work anymore, it basically is like a giant finger from the sky that goes and sticks its finger in the mud and comes back and says, ah, is this, this wet? Um, so now that part doesn't work, but we have this passive measurement that uses light reflectance to tell us how much moisture is in the soil. Um, there's another uh, satellite called GRACE, um, and my colleague Felix Lander gave a, gave a Von Karman talk, I think a few months ago or some weeks ago, on GRACE follow-on, which is continuing this amazing record. And GRACE uses a gravitational anomaly where these satellites kind of get pulled towards the Earth when there's more mass, right, because more mass equals more gravity. And so when you have a lot of groundwater, um, it'll get pulled more towards the Earth. And if you've sucked out all the groundwater because you pumped it out or there's droughts, next time they fly over, they'll get pulled less. So we can actually use this gravitational anomaly to figure out how much water there is in ground. They also use this to look at ice, ice caps and, and sea level rise. And then the last component is river discharge, how much water is coming off the rivers. We actually don't have this from space yet, but it'll be soon. Uh, the Surface Water Ocean Topography Mission, SWAT, again, uses those lasers, the LIDAR, kind of um, to measure how tall those rivers are. And that tells you how much water is flowing off. So as we start to put these together, our uncertainty in the water cycle starts to come down. And we would never have zero uncertainty, but since this is like a cartoon, I made it come to zero. Um, but you can, you can get where this is going. And what's next now is for us to integrate. It's about integration and uh, talking across the missions. Just like in the International Space Station, those missions, same with our other missions that have synergies together to tell us something about the Earth system as a whole more than the sum of its parts. So there's been a, a lot of droughts worldwide in the U.S., in California, uh, affecting crops, agriculture, and we were able to pick up on one of the biggest droughts in, uh, in U.S. history since the Dust Bowl, which happened a few years ago, um, creating this kind of bullseye right on um, the Midwest where um, almost 80% of our GDP was impacted by the drought. Um, I'm, uh, NASA has stood up a Western Water Applications Office, which has a number of personnel from JPL um, housed here. And we're reaching out to water resource managers, policymakers, farmers, um, and trying to make our data uh, useful for them in their decision making process. And so we're developing web applications and um, 
and phone apps. Um, there's a lot of citizen science at NASA as well um, to really enable uh, society to respond to a changing environment, especially with regards to water. So that's a little bit of uh, what I do here at JPL and what my colleagues do here at JPL and across, across the world. And again, we end with this, this fairy tale or this story of the princess and the pea. We are trying to establish the true identity, the true future of the Earth. What, how are ecosystems responding uh, in reality now and into the future? Um, and these are some of the take-home points that I hope you, can, you got from the talk. Uh, terrestrial ecosystems exert this dominant force in Earth's climate, and they're very complex, and that's why we have a lot of uncertainties in projections of future responses. The projected cl climate change, particularly in droughts, is being borne out in front of our eyes. CO2 fertilization sensitivity is a major uncertainty in our understanding of ecosystem future responses. And we've been developing innovative, technological, and interdisciplinary ways to tackle this part of the equation as well. And NASA, and satellite and airborne remote sensing in general, provides a deeper understanding of ecosystem responses across the Earth. And it enables this reduction of model uncertainties and can help us improve societal responses to change. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. I think we have time for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, there's a microphone there because they want, they told me to tell you guys to use the microphone. Okay. <laughs> so go line up on the microphone and pepper, pepper away. First, thank you so much for this. I trained with um, the former Vice President, the Honorable Al Gore. I'm a climate reality volunteer. Yeah, me too. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Where's your pen? Oh, yeah. But the um, question is, when you mention the lasers, can they now measure carbon emissions in the ice? In the ice? Yes. Um, so as, as carbon gets released from. So yeah, so we have, it's not using the lasers or the LIDAR. Um, we have other airborne capabilities that can take the, that we fly over and take air samples, and then we measure the CO2 from those platforms. OCO two and three and, and related satellites also can measure the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. And instead of using lasers, they use the sun, essentially. So the sun will bounce down, hit the earth, and bounce back through the atmosphere. But CO2 absorbs some of that light. And so when there's more CO2, um, there's you know, less of that light hitting the satellite. So that's how we get the CO2, um, not just in the Arctic, but globally. Great. Thank uh, did did you that kind of answer your question a little bit? Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. Uh, are there any areas in particular uh, that are abiotic, that are of interest, that are not concerned with uh, biomes? Uh, um, yeah, so I'm very much a plant person. Um, but uh, I definitely work with geologists. So for instance, the volcanologists um, in that aspect. So my interest in the abiotic land component has been on that. I'm also interested in soils, but there's always somewhat of an interaction with uh, plants uh, when we're talking about soils. Um, but in terms of areas like deserts or so on, when there are, where there are no plants, again, um, there are plants kind of everywhere, even in those deserts. And sometimes there are these rain events, and those ecosystems are adapted to really grow and take up a lot of CO2 when there are these rain events. And we need to be able to capture that and predict that as well. I don't know if that answered your question. Did, did that answer your question? I think you did. OK. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards if you want. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Question. Um, we're all very familiar on a daily basis with weather forecasts. And uh, we, we, some of us take note of when they're right and when they're wrong. But it seems that 
At least going about three days out, we can feel pretty confident they got a good idea about what's happening. Sometimes they're off, but beyond that, it diverges wildly mm -hmm. with entropy. Um, but that means that as these models in weather forecasting improve, uh, we can tell almost immediately if they're, if they're any good, right? Um, if they say it's going to rain and it doesn't rain, or if it's really windy like it was today. Can you uh, give us a little bit of an idea, talk a little bit about the time frames that we use, both what you're trying to do as far as forecasting, uh, is this about knowing what it's going to be like one season from now or just on a 10-year and 20-year model, and um, how, our, uh, how we've been doing recently and how that's changed our, our accuracy with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I, I know you must have a lot of questions wrapped up in there, but these are exactly the same questions we ask ourselves in the scientific community. And, and, and we've been looking to the uh, weather forecasting community for, as, a, as an analog, as a guide, because it didn't used to be that way. With, with weather forecasting. They actually had a rigorous systematic development of their weather models against key observable benchmarks and structured um, scoring systems that helped improve their weather models. And so um, we are just coming into that um, kind of ability in the carbon cycle or kind of the rest of the water cycle. We're just, just talking about the carbon cycle for now. Uh, so. Um, so we're, we're, we're setting up this structure to be able to create these forecasts that use these NASA-type benchmarks that evaluate the models against them and improve their predictability in the same way that weather models improved um, over their history. Now, and, and we have to do that. Um, with weather, unlike carbon, you do kind of need to know every day or you know within the week. Carbon cycle, you can, you, you can be fine with annual timescales. So there's this kind of difference as well. Weather models, yes, they break down over a couple of weeks. But if you think about it, they're actually still pretty good at an annual timescale because um, they kind of know if that the year will be warm or hot in, in, in a kind of weird way. So, um, so there is this kind of predictability based on your interest of your temporal resolution. So. Um, so in terms of climate projections, what we're interested in are like more coarse scale climate projections, not every day, much more uh, five, 10 year time scales. Um, but um, in theory, we could drive it down even further if there was, if there was a demand for it. Thanks. Um, follow up? Yeah. Um, so naturally, policymakers need to see, hey, Fritz said it would say would, it would be like this, if you will. Uh, they need to see that uh, build confidence by seeing accuracy in this. So, would it be accurate to say that this is almost because it sounds almost like it's in its infancy, uh, not the study of the climate, but when you talk about all these different elements of finally having the whole uh, hydrogeological cycle work together? Would it be accurate to say it's, it's almost in its infancy, trying to work out models now that we have so much more information to work with that it might be a while before we'll have a uh, a timeline that will give policymakers. Yeah, I mean, you you can see that um, you can see how much activity there is, right? I, I showed a lot of activity. I'm part of. There's even more, as you can imagine. So we're definitely developing. If you look at the history of these models, they haven't been around that long. So you can, you know, infancy to some, you know, a whole career for somebody else. Uh, my volcanologist works in geologic time. I work in, you know, mm -hmm. ecological time. So um, uh, there's absolutely, we're not done developing them. And I think that there's, the, there's this aspect of how much more complexly do we uh, put into these models uh, versus running more simple models faster. Um, and at the same time, in parallel, our computing uh, capabilities start to come up. And so sometimes we might have really great models, but our computing capabilities can't actually run the models that well. Other times, we have good computing, and our models don't take advantage. So there's this, this kind of handshake between computational power and model complexity uh, in terms of its development. Um, in terms of, and again, it, it comes down to your question or the policymaker's question or my question. Am I interested in um, ecological processes? That's actually my, my main love is how do ecosystems um, function, right? But if you're a policymaker, you might want to know, um, you, you might want to know something about CO2 or or mega storms or, or whatnot, or you might be interested also, like me, in how ecosystems function because 
you want to know which trees are going to die first and if your state's going to have massive wildfires and how to mobilize and, and things like that. So there's different questions that um, correspond to different types of models and required accuracies, as, as you mentioned. Um, that comes back, switching to the water side, to the, the, the last bit where I mentioned the water applications. They are def they're trying to define the accuracies required by decision makers in the water realm and whether or not we can meet them or exceed them on the NASA side. And that helps us drive our requirements both in the observations and the models to be able to meet the societal needs. All right, thanks. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your uh, talk. Uh, I just, I wondered, um, I, uh, you touched on nitrogen and uh, the, uh, my Google alert popped up a, a, a piece on, on climate change, a uh, piece on nitrogen today. It said that there's a very large component of what we expect to see in the amount of nitro nitrogen in the uh, ecosystem, I guess, and terrestrial system that's not there. And they just kind of figured out where it might be. I wondered if you could yeah, in the rocks or something? Yeah. yeah. Do you know anything? And they said it would affect models. Do you have any idea? I didn't quite <laughs> follow, but yeah. which way it would go? Um, so my buddy, Ben Holton, was the lead author of that study up at UC Davis. Um, and I just hung out with him for a bit. Um, so he's a smart guy. I don't want to say anything bad, especially because I'm being televised. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it's... I'll just, yeah, so he's, he's coming up with really good discoveries about the nitrogen and nutrient cycles, uh, and, as well as the rest of us. And, 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 and where I hung out with him was at a modeling workshop at Caltech, where we were trying to figure out how to put our newest science into models and whether or not, like I was in my response to the last question, is that complexity um, useful to models? I mentioned that in the earlier talk. Do we want more soil layers? Do we want this aspect? Do we want fungi? Um, this all just adds computational demand, and it slows down our models. But maybe it's really important. So this is, these are these questions that we have to face. We're not going to model every electron in photosynthesis. But maybe we should? Probably not. So we have to make these decisions. And it's not obviously um, quantifiable. I think it comes down to the previous questions of what are your questions, what are your objectives, and what are the accuracies required to meet those objectives. And they're different for different people. So something like that story um, would relate to different types of questions as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I'll take uh, one more question, and then um, I'll take a few questions from the, the crazy internet. I'll, I'll be, I'm nervous about this. <laughs> Uh, my question has to do with the uh, long-term increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And uh, a number of years ago, I saw a speaker talk about uh, Paleolithic times, where he said that the uh, amount of carbon dioxide at that time was 20 to 50 times greater than it is today. And I'm wondering if, you know, when we're talking about the historical increase of carbon dioxide, whether you've included that in your, in, in, in your predictions of what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, the kind of paleo record? Paleoric is really valuable, absolutely. I think that um, we do a lot of these model evaluations against the paleo record, um, the, the, or the geologic record, however you want to kind of phrase it. Um, it's in some ways easier to do the past than the present or the future because we weren't around. Um, and we add a lot of complexity. So there's very predictable cycles of how the Earth and, and, um, and, and the climate system operates. Over the, over the history of the Earth that we have some records through the Paleo record. But it's this now time when humans came into the picture that is like jolted the signal out of that historic record. And so um, that's why a lot of our interest has been on being able to capture that human element. And it's going to be, it, you can imagine how challenging that is. It's not just um, this is how much CO2 we emitted um, and how much are we going to emit, but you you know what's going to kill the Amazon first, droughts or people chopping down the Amazon, right? And and are you going to be able to capture that in the models? Human behavior and economics is 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 another beast, but there's a whole community that's focused on that as well. That handshakes with my community, which is a little bit more biological, physical side. So um, I, I guess that adds a lot of extra information that you probably weren't asking for. But that was kind of uh, um, my answer to linking that historical record for the present and the future. 
And, and what about like exoparasites like the bark beetle? Is that being uh, included in the models? And what is the overall uh, global impact of that? Great question. Um, we should definitely do lunch sometime. Um, so I mentioned disturbance, right? And I only showed a picture of fire. Um, but when there is a drought, for example, I, I'm, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm very much interested in droughts, um, having grown up in California in, in my slides. Um, it's not necessarily the, the water stress that kills the trees. It's the infestations, right? It's the, the beetles. It's the bacteria. It's the other fungi, not the good fungi, the bad fungi. Um, and so very critical. And we're still trying to come to um, grips with how much to include that complexity in models. And a lot of the models do have that, but they're kind of more, we're not like measure, you know, modeling individual beetles flying around or whatever. It's more like probabilistically speaking, if plants dry to a certain extent, they are more likely to die because of, let's call it, beetles or something. So that's how we kind of invoke some of this, um, the other disturbances outside of fire. But yeah, good question. Thank you. OK, I will take a, a few from the internet. Huh, OK. How much of an impact could machine learning and artificial intelligence have on future climate models? Section 9. What's section 9? Oh, OK. They, they told me to say who asked this. And I was expecting like a Twitter handle. but. Um, I don't know, we have sections at JPL. I was like, is this one of my colleagues like messing with me? Um, <laughs> all right, so machine learning and artificial intelligence. I guess I should speak into one of the cameras. This one's not even looking at me. Jeez. <laughs> like, all dressed up and it's like, not even. Um, OK, um, so we, we are using machine learning. I mentioned uh, to one of the responses that we just had this modeling workshop. That was a huge part of our modeling workshop was um, uh, using machine learning. So a lot of the models that I, I talked about actually um, are a little bit biased in my, um, my interest, which is what we call process modeling. I want to understand how something occurs, right? It's not that, uh, it's kind of like a model of Newton's apple hitting the floor. You could predict it because it always hits the ground at a certain time, or you could understand that there's a process related to gravity and friction and, and mass and things like that. So I'm interested in process. Machine learning um, and artificial intelligence is more in terms of taking that myriad of data and figuring out signals within it, which is certainly helpful, um, at least in terms of how I use it. And I do use machine learning. I use, I use a lot of neural networks and, and so on and data, and data products that use decision trees and, and other types of machine learning. So they're very valuable. Um, the, Challenge, I guess, is that <clears throat> machine learning uh, and AI, uh, they're trained to what's available. They're trained to your data set. And as CO2 and climate moves outside of our existing data set, we're, it's not exactly clear how trustworthy something trained to a data set now will behave in the future if there's not something that's traceable to a process. Um, it's definitely a compromise, uh, definitely uh, back and forth. I have colleagues on both sides. I use both sides, so I don't want to um, downplay that. But um, that, that's kind of my response to that question. Um, anything else? All right, well, thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>